Let's move to action prevention. Okay. So we left discussing not just creation of generation of action potential of the absolute kilo, but also why it propagates only in one direction. And we first ask ourselves, why does it go left, left in this diagram, of course, go into the cell body? And who wants to remind us why doesn't the action potential go to the, to the, towards the cell body, towards the stomach? Yes? There aren't enough voltage-gated channel in the membranes of the stomach. Therefore, although the ions can diffuse and there will be local potential, greater potential in the stomach as a result, then we cannot generate an action potential in most cases. But then we asked a more complicated question, and that is, as the action potential propagates towards the axial terminal, ions diffuse, right? And they diffuse to the front, which is OK. They also diffuse to the back. Do we have voltage-gated channels here? Yes, that's the axolema, right? So the question was, this is where we left off. Why don't we go back? Why don't we go forward, sorry, and backwards, and forwards, and backwards, which will not be very efficient, right? And this is where I want to introduce a term that is called refractory period. I know many of you are familiar with that, but for the sake of all of you, let's make sure we understand, first of all, what refractory period are, because there are two types of periods. And then we'll connect it back to the question that we raised. Why doesn't it go backwards? So let's look at the action potential graph. And you guys will remind me, first of all, as a course of 250 students, let's make sure we got it, which specific gates are making sure that there is a peak and that the depolarization event does not continue? Why do we get the peak? How do we get a peak? Which type of gates? Sodium inactivating gates, right? They close down. They started to close down at negative 55. They are slow. So at some point, they close down. And now the channel, as a channel, is closed. The activation gates are open, right? OK, we're going down because of the potassium channels that we discussed last time. And let's talk about, let's say, here in minus 20, negative 20, OK? What is the status of the activation gates of the sodium channels? Open. We are above negative 55, right? What about the inactivation gates of sodium? Open or closed? Think about it for a second before you shout. Again, I'm asking about negative 20 millivolts. What's the status of the sodium in channels inactivation gates? Open or closed? closed? They're closed. Why are they closed? You're correct. Why are they closed? Who wants to share? What's the logic? Yes. But I'm still asking about the negative 20, right? So when are they going to start closing? Negative, negative 55 at the threshold. Exactly the same threshold that opened them up. Sorry, close them down, right? It's going to open them up. But they're slow, so it will take time. Now, this was an original stimulus, and I stopped the stimulus at some point, right? I sent a ligand, and then that's it. What happens at negative 20? If now I fire again by stimulating that specific axon pillow again with a new stimulus, would that stimulus be able to generate a new action potential when we are still here at negative 20? What's the status of the sodium channels as channels? Closed or open? Closed. Stimulus can open activation gates, right? But hey, the activation gates are open already. It doesn't help. But the inactivation gates are still closed. Basically, the channels are still closed. They have not yet been reset, as was suggested here. They're not responsive in that sense to the stimulus. Of all the analogies in the world, I chose the toilet. My toilet. You need to go to the restrooms. You're doing whatever you do. Number one, number two, whatever works for you. What do you do at the end, hopefully? Flash down the water, right? Press the handle, water go down. Now think about what happens after you flush down the water. Let's say a second after that, you flush it again. Did that work? Yeah. There's a handle, you press the handle. You can press it really strong. Did that work? Yes. No. What's missing in our tank? Water. water. The tank has not been reset yet. 
The change is in its absolute refractory period. And the same thing goes for the sodium channels. The absolute refractory period is the period between when you started until the time of the threshold, we go back to the threshold, the negative 55, at that point, the sodium inactivation gates are still closed. And remember, when we stimulated the whole channel, we started with a resting state where they were open. We just, the stimulus opened the activation gates. But the sodium inactivation gates are still closed at this point, meaning that those channels are not responsive at this point. Again, kind of like the tank. The handle is there, you can stimulate it, press the handle, nothing works because the tank, the toy, is not responsive. The negative 55 millivolts, the inactivation gates start to open up. Now they do it slowly. So gradually, more and more sodium channels will become, will go and reset. Activation gates will close down very fast, very quickly, because that's what they do. Inactivation gates will start to open up. So at negative 58, for example, the majority of the channels will still be closed, but some will start get open. Okay? That's what we call the relative refractory period. That's a point where the channels start to become responsive, but not all of them responsive. Let's go back to our toilet. You press the handle, you flash down the water, okay? Now you wait a little bit, and you see the water starting to come up. After five seconds, you press the handle again. Will the water flash down? Yes, will this be as effective as if you had waited for, let's say, 10 more seconds until it's completely full? No, right? Because this is partial resetting. There's some water in the tank, there's some sodium channels that are now ready for a stimulus, but not all of them. So the response, the effect, will not be as high as if you had waited until the tank is filled with water and all the sodium channels have been reset. And all the sodium channels will be reset at the end of everything. So this is the relative refractory period. Before we go back to our questions about propagation, any questions about absolute and relative refractory periods? And toilets, number two, number one, whatever you want to ask. Okay, now let's go back to our question. Okay, so we, here we are at the axon p rock. We generated a stimulus, let's say lighting gated channels, sodium gated, got in, got sodium diffused back, but we said no voltage gated channels are not enough, so this is not relevant. At the front, sodium created a new action potential, right? Opening new channels. Here is this area in yellow. But in the back, in the pink labeled area, those sodium channels of the original site are still in there. In the what? Don't just say a refractory period. Tell me exactly which one. In the absolute refractory period. So sodium ions moved on. I mean, I'm a sodium ion. I just made it. Here's the membrane. I just made it here. I generated an action potential. OK? I and my friends. OK, I go forward. One of my friends is going backwards. But again, this area right now is still with sodium channels that are still closed because they're in the absolute refractory period. Once they will open up at the end, those sodium ions have already diffused. There are no, there's not enough stimulus, so it cannot really go backwards. It can go only one way. Okay? So if you look at the action potential at any given time, you'll find the actual stimulus, generation of an action potential, the skin potential in the, in the front, and in the back you have a refractory period. You'll see it again. Moving, moving, moving. Remember, one action potential generates the next one, generates the next one, generates the next one, but the original site, each time, an original site is on the absolute refractory period. It can go only forward and not backwards. Think about any question you might have on this question that we just generated, that we have just asked. Yes? You're saying that the molecules still backwards Exactly. The molecules, there's no one to tell the molecules, oh, you need to go only forward because this is what we really want. They go anywhere. 
right? They go forward, backwards, they go towards the middle of the, of the axon itself. It's just that the impact they have is just a local potential because you don't have, you have voltage-gated channels, but they're not effective voltage-gated channels at that point. Any other question? Yes. The time it takes. So the refractive period is the time it takes until the the absolute until they start opening up, and the relative until all of them would be reset and open up. Yes. In what sense? The question is: anything will stop an action potential? In what sense? What would you do? Great question. What do you do if you want to stop an action potential with a drug, for example? Imagine that you give a drug and that has an immediate effect. What would you block, for example? Never mind the exact name or so, but what would you do? What would you do? What's the mechanism? So maybe you can stop a ligand that binds some new stimulus, but if you talk about an action potential, I think that was the question that already started. How can you block the action potential for propagating? Right? Sodium, which channels? Voltage-gated channels, right? If you block the sodium voltage-gated channels, that will not work. Now, you cannot really, at any, in real life, you cannot really stop an action potential at the action V-lock. In between that time, until it reaches the end, a drug will become effective. That will not work. But theoretically, that's exactly the case, okay? So, but if you do provide a drug that will inhibit voltage-gated channels, you will not be able to generate an action potential. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so no, after the threshold. Channels do not, and this is very simplified what I say, based on what we learned in this class, again, it's more than just one simple inactivation gate, but based on what we just talked about, the channels don't know where they are in the whole scheme of action potential. They don't care, they don't know. What they know is I'm open above 55 or close, depending on the channel, or I'm open or close below 55. That's an electrical charge that affects their three-dimensional configuration. Okay. So, we explained unidirectionality of action potential. Let's do some prediction. Let's go for higher <coughs> blooms. I'm going to open a learning catalytics, but I'm going to ask the question I'm wrong, but actually you are correct. So, C is correct. Now, how is that different? You're saying both ways. Most of you said, and that's correct. How is that different from the original state when we had the axon p log starting here? I'm going to give a chance to someone in the back this time. Someone in the back. Again, explain. Why is that different from the regular, what, what, is, what do we have here that we didn't have in the original case where the action potential starts here and goes all the way here? Why doesn't it go backwards? Raise your hand. Yes. The channels to the left aren't in the refractory period, they haven't been removed. Perfect. Can I think of a better answer? Right? In this experiment, we opened voltage activation gates, the ions diffuse to the right of us, right, towards the axon terminal and to the left, towards the sun. This happens regularly, all the time. But this time, we have on the le your left side, towards the soma, we have voltage-gated channels, but they are not in there. In there? Not just refractory. In their absolute refractory period. Exactly. So they're new. They do not need to be reset. They're starting at the resting state. So it will go and continue. What will happen to the action potential once it reaches the action kilo? Is it going to continue towards the cell body? No. And it makes sense that this will be a mess, right? Because you want to have the movement only forward. Now again, biology and physiology is so much more complicated than the simplified version. And actually we do have cases, not a lot, but we do have cases when we have movements, or not movements, propagation of action potentials that will actually go towards the cell body. In some cases, especially hippocampus, we need that thing. So we do have those modifications. But typically, it's in very specific neurons or in experimental conditions, not in the typical neuron. Yes? So how do the rest of the neurons in the action Resting, there is an absolute and relative. 
wonderful, Michaela, right? Malikia, sorry, almost. So Malikia was asking, is a great question. What about the real relative refractive period? Will we be able to generate an action potential during the relative refractive period? I emphasize absolute. The answer is yes, you'll, need, you'll be able to do that. But what do you need to do? Think about the toilet and the water. What do you need to do in order for to generate an action potential to reach that positive feedback loop? Think about the stimulus. What will you need to do? You need to reach a threshold, and it's harder to do that when you have only some partial number, right, of the, vo of the solid voltage gauges. The channels are open, not all of them. So what will you need to do to provide a stronger stimulus? If it's a ligand, more ligand. <coughs> so during the relative refractory period, you are able to generate a new action potential. And the more you get closer to the final resting state, it will be easier and easier. But you need to provide a stronger stimulus because the original stimulus was not enough because your positive feedback chain is limited here. You don't have all the channels. Yes? In what sense do you die out? I wouldn't say I wouldn't call it die out. I would call it blocked. Yeah, because it will not it will not attenuate. It will continue until it can continue if it goes to the left. It will just be blocked because you don't have all the great chance of it. It will still be an all all or none phenomenon. Okay. Until now, we talked about unmyelinated sheath axons. Let's talk about myelin sheath. And when we introduced the myelin sheath back in our second lecture, we talked about the fact that in the myelin sheath case, it's not so much about simple insulation to prevent shorts or anything like that. It's more about the speed. Now, any action potential, any axon will, action potential will run very fast along the, action, the axon. In some cases, it can act even faster. And that's the example of these neurons. Now, which cells are these? How do we call these cells that form the mining sheet? Which ones? There are two options, right? These are Schwann cells. Why Schwann cells and not oligodendrocytes? How do you know? I did not draw a brain, but I didn't say it's not in the brain. But how would you know this is a schwann? It's true that schwannes are not in the central nervous system, but yes. One schwann cell equals one segment. Perfect, right? It's the anatomy that is different. Excellent. So how does it work? In the schwann cells, the mining sheath, or in the oligodendrocytes, in the mining sheath, the mining sheath provides insulation. In this area, this is not the real image, what will, you will still have some ECF between the myelin sheath and the axon membrane, but it's pretty much insulated, <coughs> which means that there are almost zero leaks, which means that right now, let's take this point, okay? We started the axon helix, but we'll jump already here. In between those segments, the segments, the axon has to be segmented. It's not one continuous myelin sheath. And in between those segments, what we have are what we call the nodes of Ranvier. Ranvier was a French scientist who discovered them. And what we have here is a huge concentration, much more, by the way, than the axon helon, of sodium and potassium voltage gated channels. So what happens is that the ions, basically the sodium ions that moved here, open up sodium voltage gated channels because they create a depolarization and reach a threshold very easily. We have a stream, a flood of sodium ions coming in. They go backwards, but we said that doesn't matter. And they go forward. But in this case, they don't follow the regular action potential propagation scheme that we discussed, right? If you look at me, if I'm an action potential, right, I'm going in and now I'm generating a new action potential and a new action potential and a new action potential, right? It goes very fast, but it's, again, one step at a time. But here you don't have, actually, voltage-gated channels. You don't really have them physically. You don't need them. What you have instead is a movement 
that runs, the ions run, but this time they really, really run. Almost no leakage, and they will run very fast, much faster than a regular local potential runs. <coughs> Until they reach the next node of one gear. So you have much less resistance here, and the ions move, reach the next node of one gear, open it up, another flood of ions. So, just give me a second, I'll explain, I'll promise I'll give you some chance to ask questions. So instead of doing this, one, two, three, what should I do? I leap, right? Leaping, it's called saltatory conduction. Leaping, conduction, okay? Saltate is to leap, that's exactly what's going on here. Before I answer a question, I want also to address one thing, but this is one of those cases where I'm not gonna ask you any questions about that, okay? For the sake of those of you who took physics, you know a bit more about this, just to help, but again, if you don't understand what I'm saying, don't worry about it. This is not at the level of this course. There's a term called capacitance, basically. Here what we have is something for a capacitor, which means that the more insulation I have, the faster the ions will run, will move here. The more insulation, the less of other ions that will be here that will attract those ions. Again, if you did not learn about capacitance, there's no reason for you to understand what I'm just saying. You can just take it for granted that it's not only that the ions are not leaking out, but they actually run extremely fast. Now, we have to answer your question. The channels. So ions are outside everywhere. Kind of like spread equally. But there's a high concentration of <laughs> sodium and potassium, of course, voltage gauge channels. Even higher than the axon P lock. So once you made it, boom. Flood of ions coming in and streaming in, and boom, you have another new action potential, a new stream of ions that will continue towards the next node of one here. Any other question? Basically, once you see the animation, so again, action potential and then boom. What's the, what's the type of potential running here beneath the mining sheet? Is this an action potential running? What is it? It's a gradient potential, right? Because it's not, there are no voltage gated channels. It cannot generate an action potential. It looks very complex when you actually look at the measure. It spikes and for so many reasons that we're not going to get into. Uh, but basically we need to think about it as action potential and then local potential, but extremely fast, <coughs> generating a new action potential, local potential very fast, new action potential, and so on and so forth. Any other question? Yes, no? Just know the difference between these two, and you don't need to know anything about capacitance. Just know about the fact that they are going to run here with not much resistance, and the more insulation, it's not only mining sheet, the thicker the mining sheet will be, we actually have axons with a different thickness of mining sheet, the thicker, the more insulation, will it run faster or slower? Faster, exactly. Yes, sir. So Haj is asking if, if, if it's so well insulated and we won't lose so many of them, right? Why can I just have a mining sheet all the way long? I'm not going to answer your question. I want you to think about the question. That's a wonderful what if question. But about the diffusion, first of all, you'll still have some leaks, not from here, but from other places. And second of all, don't forget one thing. Again, we have ions that go back. So we're losing some of them. And the more you go into the center of the axon, then you have less impact of those ions on the membrane potential. You know, I like to put those who follow our Facebook site, I like to put some teasers for the next day, right? What did I put last time, two days ago? There's a cello concerto, right? Anyone knows the cello concerto? Why did they even put it there? <laughs> Let's see if we can hear something here. No? Oh, you 
kidding me. Everything is on, and you cannot hear this. This is disappointing. <laughs> Anyone can guess, either her from the Facebook or just following the movements, which concerto do we hear? Do we don't hear? Sorry. This is called Elgar Cello Concerto, one of the beautiful pieces. And I'm showing this not because of the concerto, but because of the cellist. And the cellist is Jacqueline Dupre, who was one of the brilliant cellists in the 20th century. This is Daniel Birnbaum, the conductor who happens also to be her husband. But this is the the reason I'm putting it here. Let me stop here. This is unlike. The reason I'm showing it is because the Hindu prayer was a very also famous case of what we call MS, or multiple sclerosis. And she was diagnosed uh, in the age of 28, sorry, in the age of 20 plus, and progressively, she lost the ability to control her skeletal muscles, and as a result, she stopped playing the cello at 28. She actually died at the age of very uh, young age of 43. Now, I want to say first of all that today, the fact that someone has multiple sclerosis, first of all, there's a huge variance in the symptoms. There will be some that will suffer some, but not drastically. Some that will suffer a lot, but in most cases today, it definitely doesn't lead to death. Uh, Multiple sclerosis, the causes are mainly, probably I should add, because we don't know too much about the causes, is that this is what we call an autoimmune disease. We will talk about several autoimmune diseases, we'll talk about immunology as well. Uh, autoimmune disease basically is a disease where your immune system that is supposed to identify, to distinguish between self, good, and non-self, bad, messes. Messes it up and then it attacks, in this case, attacks specific cells of the nervous system. So your own immune system is attacking your own cells. In this case, these cells are the oligodendrocytes, okay? Which are responsible for the myelin sheath where? In the central nervous system, exactly. As a result, what we do, we lose the myelin sheath. And no longer we have a myelin sheath. Now, I want you to think for a second Here's a regular minded axon. And if you cannot spread the action potential, of course, then eventually the, 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 the neuron stops performing. So you cannot stimulate muscles, and that's the problem. And there are additional problems that eventually those muscles become degenerated, etc. But what I want you to do to think together in groups to ask me the following question. First of all, can unmyelinated axon drive an action potential? Do we have unmyelinated axon in our nervous system? We should do, they're not as fast, but they're perfectly fine. So in multiple sclerosis, we have demyelination, removal of the myelin sheath because the oligodendrocytes that made the myelin sheath die. And it's progressive, it doesn't happen at once. So how come this is a disease with such uh, problems well, what we actually did is made those myelinated axons into unmyelinated axons. It may be a bit slower, but it shouldn't be an issue. Is the question clear? So again, I'm asking, normally we have many unmyelinated axons that act perfectly well. In multiple sclerosis, we took myelinated axons, we killed the oligodendrocytes, so we removed the myelin. So that should be exactly like unmyelinated axon. They should act, maybe not as fast, but they can work. So how come we have such a devastating disease? Think about the mechanism, think about this, and talk with others. Excellent, I will, excellent. I will repeat what you just said. The difference between unmyelinated axons and demyelinated axons, D are those that the mind sheet was removed because of oligodendrocytes' death, is the fact that in mind axons, you don't have voltage gated channels under the sheath, only the nose of front VA. And it makes sense. You wouldn't want to waste energy in putting them there because there's a sheath. You cannot put ions through them. But when we remove, because oligodendrocyte died, when we remove the sheath, what happens is we don't have voltage gated channels so now we are back into our regular local potential. 
that needs to move. But this local potential needs to move for a long distance, right? And maybe in the beginning there will be one node of Fandier, maybe it will make it to the next node of Fandier, but once you miss a bit more of segments, basically that local potential will, as local potentials, die out and will not be able to reach all the way to the axon terminal. Again, it doesn't mean that one segment has died, one oligodendrocyte, and boom, you can't move your muscles. It's a progressive disease, but eventually, if too many oligodendrocytes die, we have a real problem. Yes. So how do they treat? There's no treatment, first of all, for the autoimmunity, basically. There's no treatment for fixing the neurons. There are different ways. One of the major ways is by drugs that cheat the autoimmune system and basically target those cells. It's many healthy T cells that we will discuss later on, and the healthy T cells attack other cells rather than themselves. <coughs> Sometimes we see cases where nutrition help, we see cases where we see that physical exercise can help, uh, but we don't have kind of like a cure where we can say, take it, it will work. it will increase the resistance not having the sheet there. Again, there is no insulation. Again, for those who talk about capacitance, we're back into the regular state when they're going to go to move slower, okay? So while normally if they move slower, there's no problem in unmanagement actions because they stimulate the new set of voltage-gated channels. We don't have those voltage-gated channels anymore. Yes. Yes, if, they, if you were able to tell those cells, make voltage gate chance, put them in the right place, that will do a pretty good job. It will just make them act slower. Maybe it will affect the function of those specific muscles that are uh, basically uh, regulated by those uh, neurons. Maybe they will not act perfectly, but it would be much better than having those muscles not act at all. Okay, the question was, if we were able to install voltage gated channels, would that help? Nobody asked me about a question that I thought you asked me. Yes, Maria? You said that before that you should die, is it because like, the cardiac muscles need the myelin sheet to work? We don't worry about the cardiac muscle because there's no myelin sheet here. Yeah. Why did they used to die? You said that they used to die, like Jack and Louis should die clearly, and you say that Because of only then because what they have is eventually you have <laughs> cells uh, Oh, you asked what eventually led to death. Yeah. Uh, can you think, anyone can help, about skeletal muscles that we have to have functioning, even more important than your heart? Diaphragm. You need to breathe. You have skeletal muscles to breathe. So if that doesn't work, it doesn't work. Yes? There are, we have no idea about what can actually cause. By the way, even the autoimmunity is more than just a good hypothesis, but there might be other factors that we are not really sure about, basically. In most cases of autoimmune, we just identify autoimmune response at the level of our own immune cells attacking. We have no idea what the cause is. Final question about this? It, a lot of other immune systems are more common in women. As far as I remember, a lot of this is one thing. It happens typically in the 20s. Uh, again, if anyone here personally or knows someone, it doesn't mean that this is okay, this is done. It's lethal and fatal, it's not. Uh, the question I did not hear from any of you, I'm sorry, I'll just continue this thing. Okay, if you have more questions later on, uh, after the class. Uh, immune, oligodendrocytes are part of what? What part of the nervous system? Central. Central nervous system, right? Are we expecting the healthy cells to be there? Our immune system to get there? What's supposed to stop it? The BBB, right? One of the pathologies of multiple sclerosis is destruction of the BBB, for example. Okay. I'm going to continue, and if you have more questions, <coughs> let me know after that. Okay, so we mentioned that mining sheets is making the action potential runs faster. 
and the thicker the mining sheath is, the faster the action potential will run. There's a second factor that will affect the speed of the propagation of action potential, and that's the size of the diameter. But this time, I'm not talking about the mining sheet, but about the axon itself. The larger the diameter of the axon, the lower the resistance, the faster the impulse. Basically, this is pretty easy to think about. If you just think about, again, now I'm walking. I won't leap here, but I'll just walk. I'm walking in this room, and I'm just walking. There's a bit resistance, right? I can hit the, the table. I might hit some students. It will slow me down, but eventually I'll make it. Versus, imagine, now you have to imagine, I'm moving in a tunnel that I can just squeeze in, hit the walls, hit everyone in the middle. The larger the diameter, the more free movement of the ions, less tackling different other ions, proteins, what have you, microtubules, less resistance, faster action potential. And with that, I think we covered everything about the action potential and its propagation. And we're going to start, until now, we talked about a neuron. Now let's talk about how they interact. Okay? So that we're going to talk about synaptic activity. <coughs> uh, going back for a second, just for the sake of the neuron. Remind me, I asked you that in the very first lecture about neurobiology. You have a question? Axon, axon, yeah, not just the money sheet is one thing, but the diameter of the axon itself. Uh, I ask you which part is responsible for receiving signals. And you guys answer? What did you guys answer? Dendrites, right? And I said, wrong, right? Not wrong because it's wrong, wrong because it's not really the whole picture. So let's discuss this. So when we talk about synapses, the area that connects one neuron to the next, we see the classic. So here is a postsynaptic neuron. The cell body and the dendrites are seen here in yellow. Here's the axon. And what we see are three different types of presynaptic neurons. We see three presynaptic neurons and presynaptic synapses. <coughs> yeah? Is it just reflection? Okay. But you need a flexion to change it. Okay, you just hear me. Hopefully. So we've got the classic axon that interacts and synapses. I'll use synapses as a verb with the postsynaptic neurons through the dendrites. That we call the axon dendritic synapses very famous, known and so on. But we also have axons presynap from presynaptic neurons that will synapse with the membrane of the soma. And we call them axosomatic synapse. This beautiful image is one of those. These are axon terminals right here, pseudo labeled, but the image is real. And this is the soma, membrane of the soma. In only. We even have axo-axonic synapses interacting with the axon, typically very, very close in close proximity to the axon PRC. So we'll see that all of them work. Now, you did your preparation for today, right, with a, oh, you did a voice read for the first time, right? How was the voice read? Kind of like thumbs up and down, helpful or not helpful? I always ask, I always wish you would say thumbs down so I can stop with those voice reads. It's really embarrassing making 